All right, now I'm going to introduce tied variables. Again, by introduce, I really mean introduce. There's a whole bunch of uh, detail that I'm just gonna glide right over and kind of pretend doesn't exist. But I do uh, have the documents you'll want to refer to to get all that detail. So without further ado, Okay, basically, what is a tied variable? Uh, the tie command binds a variable to a class. Okay, so your variable now behaves as if it were an object of that class. So whenever you see a C also, there's where the ugly details are. Uh, look at the Perl tie uh, man page or Perl doc uh, Perl tie and you'll see all the information about uh, what you need to do and what you need to know there. All right, for scalars, these are the methods that you need to provide. Some of, on these different variables, some of them are optional, some of them are required. I'm not even gonna get into all that. Again, all of this stuff is documented. See also tie scalar there. Uh, because uh, Perl actually provides, uh, I don't know, remember if these, are, I'm pretty sure these probably are core modules, but TieScaler provides you with a basically a stubbed out base class so that the things that you don't have to implement are kind of already there for you. And if you want to re-implement them, then you can. But again, that's all I'm gonna talk about that detail. So. First, you've got TieScaler, which is basically the equivalent of new. That's what creates your new object. You've got fetch, right, because you can get information out of a scalar. You've got store, because you can put stuff into scalar. You've got untie, when you want it to no longer behave like a magical variable and you just want it to be a normal variable. And you've got destroy, which, you know, basically destroys everything when you're done with it. Um, scalar is obviously the e easiest one. There's not really that much you can do with the scalar. But if you wanted to say, like create a class that has a read-only scalar, and I guarantee you there's at least one of those on CPAN. I haven't looked, but I'm sure there is. Basically what you could do is you could make fetch work, but on store you could, you know, have it do a warning, have it throw an exception, whatever you want to do and say, hey, you can't, you can't change this value. Or you, know, you could have it maybe set it once, and then once it's been set, don't let it change anymore. You know, that's just an example of some, uh, something you could do. With arrays, see also tie array for all the ugly details. You've got tie array, which again is the equivalent of new. Fetch, store, fetch size, store size, right? Because you can ask an array, how big is it? right so you need to be able to do those things if you're going to call exists on your array you need to implement that and delete right because you can delete an arbitrary position in the array oh and also i should point out that all of these are uppercase for a reason with the standard Perl convention that these are all special you know you they have to be named this if you try to do it with lowercase it's not going to work all right, arrays continued because array actually has the most stuff. Uh, you can clear out the whole array. You can pop, push, shift, unshift, splice. Extend is like if you pre-extend, you, you assign to the size of the array and say, you know, I want 10,000, you know, an array of 10,000 uh, slots. Um, untie and destroy. Not much left to say there unless anybody's got specific questions. Nope, because we're gonna, this will be much more interesting when we look at the actual implementation of one. Okay, hashes, see also tie hash for the ugly details. So you've got tie hash, you've got fetch store, first key, which will give you the very first key if you're calling like keys on your tight array. And then next key is what gets called every subsequent time after that, saying give me the next key, next key, next key, until there are no more keys. And then you've got exists to test whether or not an actual uh, key exists in the hash. Delete, clear, again, clear out the whole thing. 
Scalar is what you do in scalar context because the hash normally returns, I think, like the number of buckets or something. And for all I know, that's changed. I haven't looked at that in years, so I don't know if they've changed that or not. But anyways, whatever you want your hash to do could be completely different in scalar context. Maybe you want to return a count or something, then you can certainly do that. Untie, destroy, uh, nothing too surprising there. Okay, now we get to the good stuff, unless there are any questions first. Okay. Is that uh, big enough for everyone? All right. Uh, we'll skip over most of the stuff, except you see that I'm using IO all again. <laughs> so that's why these uh, two talks kind of uh, uh, went together. I'm also using a VTS path, which is a, a uh, module that I've written. Basically, for the purposes of this talk, you don't have to worry about what it does too much, except it does a lot of normalizing of paths. If you've got weird things with like dot dot slashes and then forwards and things like that, it puts it into a normalized form that just gives you exactly what the path should be. Other than that, you don't need to know too much about it. Um, I'm basically creating some mutators here, which I won't go into. I think I've talked about the way I set this up before. There are also Perl modules that will do this stuff for you. Um, I'm just, I don't know. This is the way I've done it for years before there were all these fancy uh, things that would create accessors and, and mutators and things for you. So this is just the way I'm used to doing it. Well, here we go. Guess what? Tie hash. That's my equivalent of new. So this gets executed when you actually run the tie command, the lowercase tie with the variable name, followed by in quotes as a string, the class that you're tying it to. All right. So uh, we're basically just blessing it into a class, the type of code you'd normally see in a new. Um, but I'm calling initialize to create all my um, mutators. And then the one important thing I, I need to know here is the key directory, because what this whole module does is it ties a hash to a file system. And it allows you, if you put in a key, just, you know, let's just say a normal key with just letters and numbers, it will just treat that as a directory slash file name, depending on at what level you're at. But if you put slashes in that, it now becomes a multi-level thing where you can have several directories deep, and then whatever's on the end is treated as a file name. So uh, we just do a lot of error checking here to see whether or not that directory even exists or if it's readable or writable. And if it isn't, we die because basically we can't do anything. On fetch, okay, you notice I'm doing my normalized path. That's the thing I told you, you don't have to worry about too much. It's just making sure my path is sane. So it's appending the key directory, which is kind of my root directory to whatever the key is that I'm passed, which could contain other slashes or maybe not. Maybe it's just, a, if it doesn't contain any slashes, it'll be a file in the root directory. That's how this gets treated. Now, this is one of the really cool things about IOL that I get to go back and talk about too, is you see I'm using this assert touch lock. What the assert and touch are doing are simulating auto vivification because you know in Perl, uh, if you try to use a hash key that doesn't exist, just by the process of using it, you actually create it um, with an undefined value as the value, but it's created nonetheless. Well, my hash works in the same way. What assert does is wonderful. I love assert. It's a make dir that allows you to make directories several levels deep. So it will just go boom, boom, boom. If you've got 10 directory levels deep, it just makes them for you if they don't exist. Uh, the touch does what the normal uh, touch command on the, the command line would do, is it just creates an empty file. Lock does file locking for you, 
which again, this is another great feature of IOL is you don't have to use a separate, uh, you know, one of the, the many different uh, file locking modules. So, and again, I'm just doing the locking to make sure that I don't have two processes that are running this module trying to overwrite the uh, information at the same time. Or in this case, actually fetch it while it's being written by something else. So I just want to make sure it's in a sane state. Two processes aren't messing around with the same file at the same time. So then I'm doing a slurp because this is a fetch. And then I close the file and I return the value. That's it. So I've now tied a hash, given it a key that represents a file on the file system, maybe several di directory levels deep, and it reads out the contents of whatever in that file. If the file is just empty, um, which the touch will not destroy the contents, it will only create the empty file if it doesn't exist. If it does exist, it will do nothing. And so you'll, you'll just get the contents back. Uh, store basically does the inverse of that. I basically got an option where you can ignore an empty key or not ignore one. Um, that's not too interesting or important right now. But again, we normalize the path, make sure it's sane. And then we do an assert and lock on it. Uh, we don't have to touch here because the mere process of, of writing out the, the contents to the file will create the file. So we don't need to do that. Um, if the last part of it, of this path key that you're uh, passing it is not an actual file name, then it's going to die because, hey, you can't. I probably should actually be throwing exceptions here. Um, that's one of the things I'll fix someday. Um, so it checks, you know, just normal sanity check stuff to say, hey, well, this is a directory or the file doesn't exist or something, you know, so I can't write to something that doesn't exist. So this is where I implement exists. And you can see, again, I'm just using IO all and checking exists. Does it exist? It tells you. Uh, delete um, does the same thing. If it's a file, then I unlink it. If it's if the type of whatever that path is up there is a directory, I try to do a, a remove directory on it and close it. And it basically loops through the whole path. And that's why you've got the pop path at the end. So it's just looping through a while loop, going at every level and either removing that directory or, you know, removing the file. Clear, this is just basically nukes it. You notice I've got the RM tree here. That's again, an IO all thing. It just says, up. Oh, I don't want that directory tree anymore and just nukes the whole thing for you, which is exactly what I want. Uh, first key just gives you the uh, the first key that when you're like when you're calling keys and you're looping through keys or if you're using each it would also get called uh, next key again just gives you the next key and uh, scalar oh yeah that's what I actually did there is I actually am returning a count of how many things are in there I don't even know that I'm actually using this method, but I put it in there anyway. So any questions on this? This is basically, this is how you actually implement it is you just create these methods with these names that uh, Perl expects to see. And when you try to do that equivalent operation on the variable that's tied, it's going to call your method instead of the normal thing that it would do. So you can make a do all kinds of wacky things. You know, if you wanted to do something in the Acme namespace and, you know, have fun with your friends, you know, have a hash that randomly deletes a key every time you fetch, you know, information from it or something. You could just do all kinds of crazy stuff, but also uh, all kinds of useful stuff. Actually, uh, if you refer back to my presentation on uh, my wiki, 
this is actually the underpinnings for doing that. When I'm storing content, I store it based on a, a file path or a directory path and a file name. That way I could organize my, so if somebody's going through and looking at it, you can actually categorize your information using the directories instead of just having to come up with a ridiculous, unique, you know, just have it all in one directory and come up with a unique file for every, uh, or a unique file name for everything. You can actually make things kind of nested. Like if I've on my wiki at home, you know, I have a section for my wife, so it's under her directory and a section for me and my kids and that sort of thing. And that way I can keep the, the uh, information all organized. So if I want to manu and again, these are all just files. So if I want to go in with VI and look at them or change the values, I can do that too. Uh, cause it's all on the file system. So unless there are any other questions, that's it. All right. Thanks for coming guys. We appreciate it.